What's up guys, it's JZNES back again with another video. Today we're talking some Zelda Oracle of Seasons here. And uh, yeah, this is actually a game uh, I had back in the day. Here's my crushed up box there. You can see it's in really great condition. Not, but you know, it's probably one of the only boxes from back in the day that like, um, kind of got into this condition. Most of my other ones are in pretty good shape, but yeah, this one's not in the best. But I did have this game back in the day, um, because, uh, actually the story of me getting this game or learning about this game obviously stems from the fact that I was a big fan of Link's Awakening, and then one day, uh, while I was at school, was at daycare actually, after school, post school, uh, I saw another kid named John, also another John, so uh, I saw him playing it, and uh, I'm like, oh shit, like, this looks just like Link's Awakening, or whatever, and, you know, I'm like, is that Zelda? Like, holy shit, there's, there's more Zelda, like, you know, on Game Boy, of all, like, systems, you know, like, I knew there was more Zelda games, or I assumed that, or whatever, but, like, I saw that, and I'm like, this is Zelda, I remember this, you know, I, I played Link's Awakening. And, uh, I recall this, this format, it looks exactly like Link's Awakening, so I was very excited about this. I'm like, holy shit, Link's Awakening is a sequel to this, you know? It's the same style of Zelda game. Like, I knew about Ocarina of Time and that kind of stuff, but those were all very different Zelda games. I didn't, I didn't know about this. This was when it was brand new. It was like 2001 or 2000 or whatever. Did this come out 2002, maybe? Um... I don't think it says, but yeah, like around then, one of those years, <laughs> probably like 2002 or 1, I'd say 2002 probably, um, anyway, so obviously Majora's Mask had released in 2000, and you know, that was just a few years before this, but then they released these ones, I think this is 2001, that's why, um, it's very, very close to Majora's Mask, that's why a lot of things kind of line up, uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about, was how referential this game is to previous Zelda titles, which there had only been a handful of at this point. You know, you had Zelda 1, 2, uh, Link to the Past, Ocarina, and Majora's Mask and Link's Awakening. So that's like six titles, you know? Obviously, a lot of the gameplay and stuff comes from Link's Awakening, and they've expanded upon that, and that's, that's all good, and they've made some improvements. For instance, one of the things I have written down here is when you get the extra, the second sword, uh, level 2 sword, um, actually it's, it's related to doing the trading side quest, you know, why, why wouldn't it be, of course, you know, you do that in Ocarina of Time, and, um, not in Majora's Mask, you do a different thing in Majora's Mask, but it's actually, um, the whole trading side quest, just like in Ocarina of Time, is in this Game Boy game, this Game Boy Color game, that is, uh, so I just, that's really cool, um, you know, there was one in Link's Awakening as well, and that was a really great, trading side quest, but this one kind of also spans uh, most of the game and is, isn't, like, uh, necessary as far as I can tell, whereas in Link's Awakening that's actually kind of part of the game, you have to do a good number, of, you actually do have, have to do the whole thing in Link's Awakening to get to uh, there. Why is this, is this just all, like, like random mode? Because this song comes in, like, way later in the game, like, what the fuck is this shit? Um... Yeah, what the f- it's, it's just- Hold on a second. Is this not in the right order? This is just random, I guess. Fuck it! I guess we're listening to the, like, sixth dungeon area right now. So, anyway. Uh, the music's really good. Um, it's kind of weird sometimes. It's not necessarily, like, the perfect Zelda soundtrack. You know, probably because of the Game Boy Color uh, soundtrack. But for what they did and what they had, uh pretty good soundtrack. Like, songs like this are pretty memorable um, and, and create an atmosphere, you know? This is like you're going to these ruins, you go through the lost woods, this is what you're hearing, you know? It's no do 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 No, it's like, ooh, it's ambient, it's scary, it's like a tense sort of atmosphere. So yeah, the music does a good job at establishing that. Um, so, you know, a lot of this uh, stuff the gameplay was taken from Link's Awakening, but there's referential stuff to characters 
and uh, the lore of uh, the other Zelda games. You know, this feels like a Zelda game, whereas Link's Awakening, uh, it felt like a Zelda game, but it was a, a side story, a sort of um, a different Zelda world. But this game has Gorons, and it has, you know, um, a Tingle. Uh, not this one, the other one has Tingle. But, um, yeah, you know, characters from uh, the, the Ocarina game and Majora's Mask game are in this game. The, uh, the windmill guy, who's also... Has the little, you know, da -da -da, da -da -da. he does that in the um, in Majora's Mask, you know, and you can find him and you, you get the mask from him and all that. He's in here. He's like one of the first characters you see. You get to hear a nice rendition of the windmill theme, you know, do do do. The song Storms, it is. Um, it's like one of the first things you do outside of being in the town there. And I like the town music too, it's very um, calming, you know, whereas. Like, uh, the village in, in uh, Link's Awakening was very calming. This is also a very calming tune, but in a different way. It, it, they, they both uh, perfectly capture that essence of, uh, of a nostalgic sort of Game Boy game. And I'm not just talking about because I'm nostalgic about it, but it has that feel, you know, to it, of that, that music. It just evokes that. So, yeah. And of course, I'm a little biased, because I did play this one back in the day. Um, after having played, like, Ocarina of Time, and I think Majora's Mask I'd played at that point. Uh, but, maybe I had played... I don't think I played Majora's Mask at that point, actually. So, um, but this is one that I, like, really heavily invested in as well. You know, Link's Awakening was one I really did love, but... Uh, having this game was like a whole new experience to that and then years later um i got uh, uh oracle of ages that was like years years later when i was trying to beat all the zelda games or whatever and uh i, I remember i had my dad buy it for me on ebay i think before i had ebay or whatever and so that was interesting so and i, I don't remember if these are ones that i emulated at all but I think I did a little bit. I can't recall. So I might have played up somewhere in between there too, but I know I definitely had like the physical cartridges for the longest time. Uh, th most of them I ended up selling or something like that. Somehow I got rid of them or whatnot, but I ended up getting them for like $10 later on at like disc replay. So, but anyway, um, I've always really liked. Uh, Oracle of Seasons. Yeah, this is the the town theme of Um I always really liked Oracle of Seasons uh, better than Ages. Um, a lot of people say like Ages has the more puzzle-based uh, gameplay with its dungeons and whatnot. And, uh, Seasons has more of an action focus, and I can agree with that to some extent. But also, like the puzzles in this game aren't any slouch, and a lot of it is like. You gotta really remember the dungeon layout. You gotta remember that there was a thing, like, at the beginning of the dungeon or, like, several rooms ago that, like, now that you have this power, you can uh, go back and, like, figure that out or whatnot. So, yeah. So the dungeon design is maybe, like, my one eh on this one. I like it for the most part. I would say it's pretty. it's pretty good. It's just not, like, my favorite dungeon design in all of Zelda games. Because um, sometimes it's really straightforward, and then sometimes it's really not, you know? And it's just like, what the fuck am I supposed to do? And half the time it's like, you know, and I get it. You're trying to get your player to, like, really think about it and try to figure things out. And I think that's cool. Um, but some of it's just really just, just out there sometimes in a few spots that I'm just like, Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, and I was, I was just would hit my head and just be like, well, what the, f I, I could have figured that out, it's so easy when I had to, like, look it up or something, and I feel so stupid once I figured out the solution was just something that, that, like, I knew, I either knew about, or I just didn't really know what to do with, and then it was like, oh, well, that was really obvious, I could have done that myself, or figured that out myself, um, but I didn't for whatever reason, because <laughs> I'm an idiot, so... It'll be interesting to see how uh, the dungeons continue to progress uh, throughout the series and if I get really stuck on them 
or if this is just like actually the pinnacle of like weird obscure things in Zelda dungeons and I'm sure it's not over because I know there's like so many more Zelda dungeons I got stuck on certain parts uh, in the future there and I know there's a specific part like pretty late into Oracle of Ages where uh, they kind of force you to, to do a thing to, to finish a dungeon and I just I couldn't bring myself to do it uh, previously but now that I have save states and stuff that's gonna be really helpful um, and I gotta, I gotta say that was pretty a pretty helpful aspect of this game. Um, you, you know, they need to bring this shit to the Switch online uh, or whatever, but really, I don't want them to because I really just want them to remake these games as a combined package. I mean, even the guides are together. You know, here's the Nintendo Power one, here's the Primo one. But even those are mashed together in, in a sense. And it, it, like, just bring out a Switch version where you remake them in the same style with Link's Awakening remake. And you're brilliant. Charge 60 bucks for both of them together or charge 60 bucks for both of them individually. You know, if you want to pull a Pokemon on it. People will buy it. You know, make like a $100 collection pack or something. You know, where you put them into some specialty case or something. Um, and then just have passwords or have save functionality between the two. You don't even need passwords anymore. Uh, the, the neat thing about these games, and we'll see this in the Oracle of Ages review, is certain aspects from this game are going to carry over to that game because I got a password at the end of this game, and also I'll be able to face Ganon in that game. Something I've never actually done. I never did do the linked content. Uh, I always wanted to do that, and last time I tried to do this, I started with Oracle of Ages, which was my mistake right there. So this time I started with the better game, Oracle of Seasons, the better game in my opinion. You know, like, let's get into that. Like, why is it necessarily the better of the two games, in my opinion? Well, uh, first of all, it's the one I had, you know, so a little biased there. But I think the Seasons gimmick is a lot better than the Time gimmick. Technically, we've already done the Time gimmick, like, once and maybe technically even twice, if you want to count the Dark World in Link to the Past there. Uh, so switching between worlds, like, it's a cool gimmick, and especially on the Game Boy, like, that's pretty cool, but, dude, like, we've been there, we've done that. The Ages concept is like switching between four worlds, it's the same world you're switching between, but you have different aspects of each, uh, area that you can experience in different seasons. So, for instance, in the winter, there'll be new paths, uh, built out of the snow, that you can travel on, or maybe some ice you can walk over instead of having to fall into the water until you get the flippers later on. Or in the fall, you get to, um, you can pick up these mushrooms that are everywhere that are just like stone mushrooms in other seasons, so, you know, they're just blocking your path all the time. Or, uh, in the summer, or is it spring? Spring, spring has the little blooming flower things that you can, like, bounce off of and they'll, like, shoot you up, kind of like... Uh, Deku Link in Majora's Mask there, except you don't get to fly around. And then uh, Summer has vines that you can crawl up on, so it's a nice little balance there. But you don't start with all the seasons on your rod. Actually, the uh, Temple of Seasons is brought down into this, like, sub-world uh, called Sub Subarosa or what whatever. Um, which is like this underground world that you also have to go to during the game and it has these like different sort of um inhabitants that are all just in these like cloaks and they've all got hoods over their faces and you just see their two little big eyes um as they run around and stuff and there's lots of little side quests down there and i think that's really cool um and they keep having you come back to this from different uh like warp points from the uh, above world in the game so it's a really cool sort of secondary area up to the game that also adds a lot uh, of content there and they don't let you use rupees down there so you have to dig around for ores um, and they actually like want you to like pay with seeds and stuff which is kind of crazy yeah there's, there's a bunch of new equipment in this game too you have like seeds um, so you have like a scent seed which I don't know what that fuck that's for actually I don't think I ever used that legitimately for anything uh, there's the Ember Seed, which you use a lot to light torches and that kind of thing. There's the Pegasus Seed, which you use in replacement for the Pegasus Boots. So, 
uh, you know, in situations where you have to go fast or you want to get a running jump start because they have the, uh, the Rock's Feather again in this game. They actually have an upgrade to that called the Rock's Cape, which I thought was going to be like the cape from Link to the Past where it makes you invisible and stuff, but no, it's actually just... Uh, an upgrade to the feather where it actually lets you like glide like fucking knuckles or some shit like it's pretty cool actually it's like I, I, I didn't remember that the, that was in this game um, as well as they have a slingshot in this game but it's not like the slingshot that you know because you actually use your seeds to uh, do different things with it so based on whatever seed you shoot out um, you know you can have different effects on enemies and stuff but uh, there's also a Hyper Slingshot, which you get in the last dungeon, which is, like, pretty underused. Uh, but it'll let you shoot, like, multiple target, uh, areas at once. You can, like, light multiple torches and stuff. Okay, cool. Whatever. Y you barely use the thing. A little, little underused there. Um, honestly, I thought it was gonna be, like, the, uh, hook shot instead of that cape or whatever, but, um, no, I, I guess that wasn't in this game. I think maybe the hook shot is in, um, Ages, though. I can't, I can't remember. It's it's been a lot. It's been ages since I played it. <laughs> yeah, but um, actually, oh, it's funny because uh, I'll bring it out next time. But I actually have like a choose your own adventure book for ages that kind of serves as like a guide as well. It's actually sitting over there. Um, there is one for seasons as well. You know, they were uh, they they had them in like those book fairs. Uh, you know that they had um, when we were kids or whatever and. So I got that, and I, I thought that was always pretty cool. But it, it let me experience uh, kind of some of the ages stuff. Um, also, my friend Nick, uh, not the friend Nick that I have now, but a different friend Nick who I've, I mentioned like in my Mega Man Battle Network review and stuff like that. Um, he also had um, a Game Boy. You know, we would always play games. Um, we always had like the different versions of stuff than each other, though, like. Um, we were both big fans of Pokemon, so we had, like, different versions of that. And then we had, like, um, uh, he had Ages while I had Seasons, which is pretty cool. So, uh, I got to kind of see some of that content through there, and also from reading this book. So, yeah, so that's a little bit of, so I have a little bit of knowledge about Ages, but it's just, like, one of those that, like, doesn't stick out to me as much. Also, these games are made by Capcom, like, mind blown, like, uh, you know, uh, fucking, like, some of the best Zelda games made by Capcom, like, isn't that crazy? Doesn't that just blow your mind? Uh, X Minish Cap is also made by them, so it's kind of like their unofficial little trilogy. There was supposed to be a third game, um, in the Game Boy Color ones, and these were all supposed to be sort of remakes of Zelda 1, uh, and in that sense, actually, there's a lot of little references to Zelda 1, um, and I was writing that in my notes here. The opening first dungeon is like a, a very loving homage to Zelda 1's dungeon. Um, and uh, also from like Link's Awakening. And it being a tree, you know, which is like the Zelda 1 dungeon and, you know, Ocarina of Time's dungeon. The Great Deku Tree. Um, but yeah, so that's cool. So you go and it looks just like Zelda 1 where you like walk over a bridge. There it is, is the tree. And... You go inside, and, uh, the boom, there's boomerang moblins, and the, there's an old hint man, which, like, you know, is a, is a very Zelda 1 concept, is the old, the old, old guys that give you the clues or whatever, uh, but there's also ones where you burn bushes, yeah, you burn bushes in this game, just like in Zelda 1, and, uh, there'll be ones that'll take your money or give you money, uh, and also ones that'll, like, give you clues and stuff down there. And there's also one that gives you a side quest where you have to kill four golden um, enemies throughout the world and then it'll give you the red ring, you know, like the red ring from Zelda. And they have uh, lots of little rings and stuff in this game and I'll, I'll talk about that here in a minute, but I just want to get through these like Zelda 1 references here. And then the first boss is also Aquamentus, the dragon from Zelda 1, but they gave him a new flying animation, which is really cool. So... Um... Yeah, and I put that this game is kind of like the Majora's Mask of Link's Awakening, which is which is pretty true. It's like, you know, a very quality sequel uh, with a lot of more characters and stuff from those games uh, that cross over and whatnot, which is just interesting. And I, um, I wrote how the Dodongo fight in the second dungeon is a brilliant subversion of the expectations 
we've, we've done the fight twice, you know, uh, in Zelda 1 where you just feed him the bombs, and then in Ocarina of Time where you throw the bombs in his mouth as well. Um, so you expect that's what you have to do in this dungeon, but what you actually have to do is um, throw the bombs and then pick him up with the the gauntlet or the the power bracelet that you get in that dungeon and then throw him onto these spikes. So it took me a minute to figure that out, but once I did, I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So we're we're doing something new with this concept, which is cool. So it's a it's a great evolution of the concept, is what I wrote. Then I wrote that you could break the pots with the sword, which we've already been over, which is really cool. Like that's a great uh, addition because a lot of people's complaint was that. Um, you know, you had to keep equipping the power bracelet. You still have to do that for most things in this game. Um, but at least the pots you can break with the uh, secondary sword there. So yeah, um, I was talking about the seeds. So there's also a seed that like lets you warp places, um, which is pretty cool. So you use this to warp between the different seed trees and, and it'll get you around the world. And that's really neat. So aside from that, there's also the Mystery Seed, which lets you talk to owl statues out in the world, too. They're, they're in the dungeons, but they're also out in the world that just, like, give you hints and stuff, so that's pretty cool. Uh, almost like um, the Sheikah Stones from Ocarina of Time, so it's almost like that concept brought into this 8-bit game. It just, that's, that's what's so cool about this game, is it's just like, it's like Zelda 1, but, like, fully realized, you know? And I just think that's so cool. Um... And it's actually a pretty explorable world. Maybe not as much as, like, Zelda 1, but, um, you do... They do let you off the leash a little bit to just kind of run around to different areas. You're always going to be roadblocked a little bit, but, uh... I, I still appreciate the classic, um... Zelda letting you explore sort of thing. And then you, you get to explore more areas once you, uh... Get new seasons on your rod there. Um, throughout the game and then once you you know kind of get new items and stuff to be able to access new areas so very much it's like Link's Awakening in that sense uh, very comparable world in terms of size and whatnot but uh, you know this world is also pretty dense with secrets uh, similarly to, Link to Link's Awakening um, you know they're kind of all over the place there's really only uh, 12 heart pieces in this game, which is kind of insane. That's like probably got to be like one of the least amounts of heart pieces ever. Um, like, I don't know how that works. Like, how, how did that work? Because that's only a few hearts. Like, But yeah, only 12 heart pieces. Uh, so that's kind of crazy. But... Um, yeah, you, you get to, you, you know, of course you get a heart piece in every dungeon, and you kind of get, um, like a, they call them essences, essences in this game, um, and they're kind of like the equivalent to the instruments that you're collecting, the Triforce pieces, but you know, then again, there's eight dungeons, just like the, the other 8-bit games, and you go through them, and, uh, you know, I, I think, doesn't every Zelda game have, like, eight dungeons, though, um, well, like, Ocarina probably had more Majora's Mask, like, four dungeons, but you know what I'm saying. Like, anyway, not important. So, yeah, alongside the seeds, which is a new addition, you have these rings, which are pretty cool. So you find these rings throughout the world. Um, you can also plant Gasha seeds, which are kind of a rare resource that you can buy at some stores, or you can get them through doing little side quests or, like, kind of, going off the beaten path to find like a treasure chest or something, you get these Gasha seeds. You plant them in these spots uh, that are all around the world, these soft soils, uh, kind of like Majora's Mask and Ocarina of Time have the soft soils. Um, mostly like Ocarina of Time in that sense. But uh, rather than growing like a little pad that you like zoom around on or whatever, you, um, you get to grow these trees. And based on how many enemies you defeat, uh, supposedly, based on if you defeat more enemies, it'll give you better yields. Uh, I don't know if I, like, necessarily found that. I think, because I found that in a few articles that said that, but then, like, it was, like, one or two that said that, and then, like, all the rest of them, like, never mentioned that, and just mentioned how certain spots throughout the world yield better 
levels of, um, of rings there. So there's five levels of rings. You obviously want the higher level ones, uh, cause they're the more useful ones. And they do all sorts of stuff, like, um, one of them makes it so your bombs don't explode on you, so you don't take any damage from bombs is another one. And there's one that summons, like, uh, Maple the Witch more, and that kind of thing. There's this witch, she flies around, and you'll, uh, by defeating enemies, you get the chance to encounter her, you bump into her, she can have rings on her, she can also have heart piece, uh, heart, a single heart piece on her, or the potion, uh, which is like in Link's Awakening, it'll let you revive yourself, you know, there's no fairies and bottles in this game, you kind of just have to, uh, go buy that from the witch, or you get it from her, uh, which is a lot cheaper to do, so, yeah, so you'll be running into Maple a lot, I like Maple, I think that's a good inclusion to the game. But sometimes she'll have rare rings on her, sometimes she'll have shitty rings on her. I never really got that many good ones off of Maple, but um, she kind of has the same pool as the Gasha Seeds, uh, but more because it's just like the whole pool of, of rings that you could probably get from her. But um, yeah, so but you plant these Gasha Seeds. You know, they're, they're all over the game, but the later game ones, like the one in the Goron Mountains and Tarm Ruins, uh, are the ones that are the really good ones that will yield uh, level 4 and 5 rings. All the other ones only yield like 3 and 1 and 2 rings. Um, so, you want to plant your Gasha Seeds there, uh, pro tip, so maybe save them for that, uh, so you have the most chances. Um, because, like, the early rings, they don't do a whole lot. There, there's a few good ones, but, like, um... But, like, some of the later ones are a lot better. They're, they're more like the rings that you, you would find in other Zelda games. You know, extra defense, extra, um, attack, and stuff. Um, and that's what the red ring in this game does, is the extra attack or whatever. And it really helps, especially on top of having the level 2 sword, um... Makes quick work of enemies and bosses and stuff. So, yeah, definitely worth doing. The only thing I don't like is that, like, this, you can only get the red ring in this game. You can't get the blue ring, which actually um, ups your defense. It's kind of like in Link's Awakening where, uh, with the color dungeon, they, they introduced the red and blue rings. And you could, uh, you got the tunics anyway, and you got to choose between those, and they would do higher attack or higher defense based on that but the way this game works is you get one you get the red one which gives you higher attack because you chose uh, seasons instead of ages so in ages we'll be able to get the uh, the blue one so you know but it, it kind of sucks that you don't get to choose between them or whatever like you did in Link's Awakening it would have been nice to have, at least have the choice um, I probably still would have gone with higher attack I, I don't know though I kind of wanted one with like defense um because you can if you get that ring box it'll let you carry three of them instead of just one of them at a time and then you can choose between them and equip them whenever uh the situation calls for them otherwise you usually can only carry one ring and the rest of your rings are stored uh back at the ring guy in uh the the main town there so yeah um but yes yeah, so you find these rings throughout the world you have to get them appraised at that guy in the town. It costs you 20 rupees. It's not that much. So um, then he'll tell you, oh, it's this ring. And if you already have that ring, he'll buy it back from you for 30 rupees or whatnot. It always sucks when you have another ring that you have. Like you maybe found it or something. You're like, oh, man, this is going to be something cool. And it's just like one you already had and you just get rupees for it. Because like rupees in this game aren't that hard to farm. I, I wasn't even like trying to get them and, and a lot of times you know they're, they're very abundant and I think that's good because you do need them to buy different things in this game um, just at random times and you have to buy like this treasure map later that it's actually essential to the game and like um, you can buy like the flute or the, the the other two items to get like one of the animal companions so there's like a bear there's a kangaroo and like a the dongo looking thing the one swims the one uh flies the bear and then ricky the, the the kangaroo there he punches and can jump a little bit kind of thing 
So you could kind of choose one. I think the bear is like the best companion. I don't think the other two really have that much like range of like shit they can do really that much. So they're really not that great of a choice uh, in comparison to, to the bear. Because he can uh, fly over lots of gaps and stuff and, and it's just really super helpful. Um, so I went with the bear. But, uh, yeah, so stuff like that. You can buy a gosh to seize, or you can buy, like, the potion, which costs, like, 300 rupees, or just all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, but there's a lot of items like that that are just kind of scattered throughout the world. I, I like that there's lots of little extra stuff to do. I, I kind of like doing that kind of stuff in Zelda games. You know, Majora's Mask Peak, my favorite one, and all that. So... I really appreciate um, there being sort of lots of extra little areas to explore and getting rupees and like these gasha seeds, trying to find all the little spots for that to to um, plant them and that kind of, you know, just little extra stuff like that really goes a long way for me. Um, there'll be treasure chests kind of just like scattered through it, throughout the world where there's like a puzzle. It's like, oh, how do I get this one? And then you like figure it out and you're like, oh man, that's really cool. Um, you know, based on changing the seasons, a lot of different things can happen. So you're always thinking on your feet, like, hey, if I change the season here, will it do anything? Maybe I can get that chest if I change the season here, you know, um, sort of thing. So, yeah. So, so like, it's always, um, it's always a game where you're kind of constantly thinking, what can I do in this area? What kind of collectible could be here? You know, this kind of thing. You're always trying to explore. And I think that's really cool. So yeah, um, and in terms of like uh, having your items and stuff, you do have to go into the menu a lot, just like Link's Awakening. I think this is what the Switch remake could fix. Um, I don't remember exactly how they did it in Link's Awakening uh, remake, but they did it better, if I remember correctly. Because, well, because they had more buttons, so they made like A, B, the sword and shield, and then like... X and Y, you could put, like, extra items and stuff on there, right? Something to that effect. Uh, that would be super helpful. If you could just do that in this game, uh, that, that would be, like, insanely helpful. Make the power bracelet uh, context-sensitive. Shit like that would just be mm, chef's kiss. This game would be fucking amazing if shit like that was in there. Um, you know, you still have the problems with the dungeon design. So not problems. They're, it's just like a nitpicky sort of thing. I mean, I still really love this game, and I'm, I'm not gonna give it a bunch of shit for its dungeon design, just because I'm kind of stupid at that kind of shit sometimes. It, it definitely encourages your exploration and whatnot. And, um, it, it's not like they don't give you the tools. You know, you have the map, you have the compass, you have online guides if you're really looking for that kind of thing, or you can just get the real guide. Um... These are very helpful guides, too, by the way. They have, like, all the items and all the rings and stuff. They tell you where to get it all. Like, that's pretty good. I like that. I do refer to the online stuff just a little more for, for a little more clarity because years and years of um, discoveries of the game have made this a, a lot easier. You know, that's kind of how the internet... You know, this is, like, a pretty good thing, but you, you want to read into it a little bit more sometimes if you're really trying to dig deep into the game, so. Um. So, yeah. So, anyway, but, like, th that, if they just, if they just put a few extra little buttons for, um, carrying your items and whatnot, I think this game would benefit a lot from that. Um, because you do have to constantly switch out a lot. Aside from that, like, I really wouldn't change that much. This game is, uh, is, is a lot of fun. And I, I did have a good time playing it, and um, I think it was like probably the perfect amount of difficulty. It wasn't too hard, but it wasn't too unfair either. Um, and like I said, just kind of figuring everything out. I think I had a, a good assortment of items. Um, I do like how you get the bombs early. Um, very much like Zelda 1 where you can just kind of you just kind of get them 
almost right away, and you just go for it. There's uh, bombable walls here. Um, you know, they're all clearly marked like they were in Link's Awakening, but you always have to be watching out for those. Um, that was actually a solution to a thing one time, was there was a bombable wall, and, and uh, it helped me find the compass, and I'm just like, oh my god, I, how did I not see that? I'm clearly not paying that much attention um, sometimes. So, but yeah, I like that. Um, like, I, I like having the Rock's Feather again. Like, that's that's always been a good item. I've really always liked that. Uh, makes for good gameplay. Uh, there's the, the Magnetic Gloves in this game, which I don't know if they make an appearance in any other Zelda game outside of maybe Ages or something. But you can, like, uh, magnetize yourself to stuff. Uh, it kind of is, like, the replacement for the hook shot, but it, like, lets you do a few more things. Like, you can... There's, like, these rotating magnet things, and so you hold on to them, and then you'll go to a different side, and then you can, like, push yourself away from it to... Um, so, so you can, like, either pull towards it or push yourself away from it, and it actually lets you, like, uh, magnetically move blocks and... Uh, not blocks. They're, like, these little ball things. Um... And they can, like, take out enemies or, like, put them on switches and stuff. And that, that's cool. I like all of that. I think that's good. Um, sometimes it's a little bit of, like, uh, how do I get this to go to where I want it to go kind of thing. And so you have to kind of figure that out or, like, figure out what even is the purpose of having that ball there in this situation. Um, so, yeah, they do do a good amount with that. But, uh, yeah, let, let's, uh, let's see. Oh, you know, and of course the, uh, I, ta I already talked about the, uh, the rod of, uh, seasons there. Just trying to think what were all the items, um, that I'm not even thinking of right now. Okay. There's actually, like, a lot of post-game content, too, um, or like link game content, like I see here that you can get the mirror shield and like the bigger on sword, but you have to um, you have to have linked the game. So I guess we'll get those in the next game. Um, the master sword you can get. Um, wait a second, noble sword, but that's the one I got. Trading game, false return. Oh, okay. So the Master Sword, I think you can get in the second playthrough or whatnot. Um, yeah, like I said, the flutes. Um, so you get the bombs. The boomerang makes an appearance again, which is great. Um, the hyper slingshot, like I talked about. Yeah, okay, so the long hook, uh, I guess, is going to be in the, the next game. This, You know, it's a guide for both of the games, so it's like I got to... Oh yeah, and then they give you this magical boomerang, which is like, it lets you, if you hold the button, you can like control, sort of, the trajectory of the boomerang. Like, it's just kind of interesting, you know? Talk about the magnetic gloves, the power, power bracelet, power gloves. So this is in the other game. Okay, yep. Rock's feather, seed satchel. Of course the shovel, you gotta like that. The switch hook, that's... Right, so that's in the next game. Because I always remember, like, switching places with, um, like, those balls. Those those magnetic balls that you, like, move around or whatever. You can switch places with them in the other game. And that's, so that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, it's from, uh, ages. But I could have swore it was in this game, too. But, no, it's not. So. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, apparently some monsters are attracted to the scent too. That's that's what the purpose of that is. Okay. <laughs> so Yeah, I guess that's kind of all the items. Um, you know, and then you have your trading side quests like items and whatnot. <laughs> Which um as I said that was a pretty good side quest. I don't know, I just wanna make sure I talked about all the items and stuff. I think this game is great. Um Definitely worth experiencing if you're a fan of Link's Awakening or, you know, Zelda 1 or that kind of thing. Or even like A Link to the Past. Um, and then the nice thing is this game links up with the other game, Oracle of Ages. Um, 
So it makes it a better experience because like certain characters from this game are going to carry over into that game. So if you really liked Oracle of Ages and you want to play that one first, you can uh, link those characters into this game or vice versa. So it's like, it's really nice. And then you get the real ending with Twin Rova reviving Ganon. You get to fight Ganon, that kind of thing. So it'd be cool uh, to do that. Um, and I'll, I'm going to be excited to see kind of what uh, little things are changed for being linked and what kind of items and stuff I can get uh, for that experience for Oracle of Ages. And actually, now that I'm thinking about it, it'll actually make Oracle of Ages a lot easier, which is the harder game anyway, so good. Let's let's make that game as easy as possible um, because I am still like a little apprehensive to be going back to it. But, you know, we're doing all the Zelda games and there's no changing that. So here we go, you know, like, good. Um, oh, and visually, like, this game looks great. Um, you know, it's, it's like a more refined Link's Awakening, and, and it just looks very similar to that style, and it's still 8-bit, and that, that's just charming as all fuck, and I love that. Um, so, they, they added so much to the world, and just what they could do with the 8-bit aesthetic, it's just great. I love that. Um. So like big thumbs up on the aesthetic department and it's colorful it's it's all in color you know because game boy color this is like big title for that so the fact that they can still make this game so late into the like game boy color life cycle too is like just crazy this is a late release i i wasn't even thinking of that like this is pretty late and it's it's a great game you know uh, it deserves not to be forgotten I, I don't feel like a lot of people talk about these oracle games that much people do talk about them but not as much as, as they uh, they could, in a sense. And I'll, I think a lot of people kind of write them off, like, oh, these aren't that great. Um, no, I, I think that they definitely deserve to be um, seen as some of the better Zelda games. Now, I know we're talking Zelda games here, so it's kind of a hard uh, sell, but um, I'd still put them up there, you know? Um, but, yes. Yeah, the aesthetics are good, the music's good, the gameplay is tight and solid, and I like all the extra content and the side stuff that you can do, so you're always exploring the world, and that's really nice. I like the, the uh, gimmick of the, the seasons rod, I think that's really innovative and cool, and you never really can do anything like that again in any other Zelda game, so that's just really neat, love that. Um, Yeah, and all just like the little Zelda flourishes from the previous games, you know, they, they had little bits of all of the previous games, and I think that's really cool. Um, and I know the Gorons were kind of the main thing of this game, but just reading through that, I, I see that the Zoras are going to be in the next game, so like, holy shit, like, um, they even have that, you know, like... Gorons and Zoras, like, I think that's cool, you know, um, and the Dekus, the Deku Scrubs are in this game, uh, you know, the, the merchant, like, sort of characters, you buy stuff from them, they give you hints sometimes, and that kind of stuff, just, just like an Ocarina of Time, it's great, it's, it's all very connected to that, and it all feels like an extension of that, which is just so cool, and very, um, impressive that they were all able to fit this on a, a Game Boy Color cartridge, um, <laughs> Yeah, and I just think, um, overall, there's really not that much wrong with the game. Uh, the dungeon design can be a little confusing sometimes. Um, but that's, that's really about it. And so, I think I want to give this game a 9.7 out of 10. Um, just, you know, little nitpicky dungeon stuff. That's, you know, that's about it. That's the only reason it's, like, not a 10 out of 10 for me, but... It gets damn close, because it's like, it's still really good. Um, but, you know, I don't want to give all the Zelda games a 10 out of 10. I, I don't imagine uh, Oracle of Ages or fucking, like, Phantom Hourglass are going to get a 10 anyway, so no worries about that. And I'm certainly Skyward Sword's not getting a 10. It's going to get like a fucking 1 or some shit. So, but we'll get there when we get there. Luckily, that's still a long ways off, and uh, I'm still in the good era of Zelda right now, you know, with Oracle of Ages uh, being, eh, you know, like, somewhere in that area. 
Um, I think that's what bothers me too. Is everyone always talks about ages, and they're always like, "That's the one. That's the good one." And it's like, no, you know, yeah, like Seasons is really good. You should probably play that. And like everyone's just like, "No, nah, I played Ages," and I'm just like, "Yeah, but you should have played Seasons." <laughs> so, I don't know. I like all the callbacks. I like um, a lot of bosses are from Zelda One, like the Aquamentis and like the Two-Headed Dragon guy is in the later dungeon, even like the Dodongo, they have Goma in there, they're all pretty much from Zelda 1, uh, a lot of them are. Even this, there's like this one where it has like these, uh, plant heads around one of those like, big jelly, like shocky guys, or whatever, and then, but it, it's very reminiscent of the, uh, the one guy who has those like little heads, and he like, you know, roams around, like the, in Zelda 1, and you have to like, place the bomb, and you just blow them up in one go, kind of thing. If that makes any sense. I don't know if anybody's understanding what I'm, like, trying to visualize for you there. But, uh, but kind of is reminiscent of that. So it's a lot of reminiscent stuff on the Zelda 1 there. I, I just really appreciate that, because I love Zelda 1. Um, so yeah, Oracle of Seasons, great game. You know, you should definitely play it, and I fucking super hope that they remake these games someday for the Switch in that same style as Link's Awakening. That would just be perfect and give us a little bit more um, control of like a few more buttons for the items. And I think this game would be like fucking perfect if you do that. And we just tighten up the dungeons a little bit and it'd be great. So yeah, I love this game. Um, 9.7 out of 10. Until next time, we're going to do Oracle of uh, Ages next, so this has been Jay-Z NES saying keep it classic, stick around for more reviews on Underrated Games, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Jay-Z 